Canada is a huge country with many diverse landscapes and time zones, and depending on your longitude, many different daylights. And I love meeting quilters from across the country and hearing how different and alike our lives are. Today's guest is Erin Suliak from the Northwest Territories, and she comes from a long line of quilters. And we are talking about how living that far north affects how you quilt, what you quilt with, and how you see color. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Erin Suliak. Welcome, Erin. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm just so delighted to have you here. And you're coming to us from the far north in Canada. How close are you to the Arctic Circle? Oh, we're still quite a bit away from the Arctic Circle, but we're definitely north of 60. So I'm, I'm coming to you from Yellowknife Northwest Territories, which is my birthplace and the place where I am so proud to call home now. So when will you lose the daylight completely? Oh, yes, the important question. Well, it's starting to get pretty dark now. Once you hit the equinox, then things really start to speed up. I would say by the end of October, it starts to, to get pretty dim. And then once December hits, it's pretty twilighty. It'll be, you know, during the darkest days, the sun sort of um, just shoots over the horizon for a few hours and, and then bumps back down. But the thing is, is it, it sounds as though it's really dark, but it actually isn't because um, there's snow on the ground. So you get a lot of reflection off of the snow and it doesn't feel as dark as it would perhaps if you didn't have snow. You wait a day and it's changing. I mean, the incremental changes, they jump quite a lot. So if you just wait a week, there's quite a difference in a week, whether you're losing light or if you're gaining light. So it's a really dynamic feeling. Even when you're, you're going into the dark, you know, oh, well, once December 21st hits, we're going to be bouncing back up. And the quality of the light is always changing. And that's one of the beautiful things that if you quiet and you can observe and you can listen, you can really experience this really interesting light that that happens in the winter and then the flip side you have the benefits of the midnight sun in the summer so it's just ever changing yeah light is something definitely that I think northerners come to appreciate quite a bit and how does that affect your time for quilting when it gets dark like that? I think a lot of Canadians or people that live in the Northern Hemisphere, you start depending a lot on your extra light. So I try to just have as much light in the space as I can. And I find as my eyes get older, I need to have more light too. So I have about three or four different sources of light when it's winter time. I tend to leave my handwork for the weekends when I can do it, you know, with natural light. And I do my sewing at night with a whole bunch of lamps on. <laughs> you have an amazing Instagram feed. You've always seem to be able to find the color in your surroundings. Have you always looked for color? I think so. Yesterday I, I posted a little bit about, it's strange, but my Baba, my Ukrainian grandmother, she used to cover hangers with and I think a lot of people are familiar with this craft I saw that and you even referenced the name of the yarn and I went all oh, right that's what it was <laughs> you should be able to get it at Wilco my baba was so mad when Wilco closed because <laughs> it made it more difficult to find that stuff and so it's interesting because I think this love of color comes from a long way back and maybe it maybe it's in my genes because you know, just opening the closet, you have this riot of color above the clothes because she she would never do the same color combination twice. It's just this just crazy rainbow of color, um, even even in the most mundane of places. And her garden um, was really loud and brightly colored. I had gardeners on on the on my mother's side too. My grandfather was also an amazing gardener and and uh, bred gladiolas. And I think it's just inherent. I also um, grew up with quilts in the house and those quilts were always a riot of color. They were never these really careful, composed, sedate things. They were always scrappy and they incorporated tons of different scraps. My great-grandmother on my mom's side, she would make quilts with her daughter and they had a very large family. So my mother has seven brothers and sisters and then, you know, there's, there's family um, expanding outwards too, but they would give a quilt to every newborn child. They would give a quilt to, um, to, for every wedding. And those quilts were real riots of color in composition. They did a lot of applique quilts. And so all of the pieces of applique were done with, you know, that polyester double knit, but like 
wild and crazy combinations. And that I just kind of, that was just the background. And I feel that that's knowing that fiber work and textile work could be scrappy and vibrant and have so many different colors in it. I, I feel that that's, I've, I've taken that forward with me for sure. Do you still have some of the quilts that your great grandmother made? I do. Yes, I have two. One is my childhood quilt. So the one that was given to me when I was born. And then I inherited one who we're not really sure who made it. It may have been my great grandmother. It may have been my great aunt. It may have been my grandmother, but not likely. She didn't really, sewing wasn't really her thing. She was a teacher. Um, she was more cerebral. She wasn't really a maker so much, although she was an excellent pie maker, excellent cook. So I have those two quilts and, and the, that unknown quilt. We know that one of my matriarchs made it. It is an absolute riot. It is it's scrappy pieced. It's all over the place. It's hard to tell where it starts and stops. There's these elements that just kind of cascade around each other. It's applique, sort of a applique on, it must be applique on a, on a base, on a foundation. And I have those quilts, um, that one in particular that I just love. It's falling apart. Um, it was really well loved um, in the family. Um, but we even brought it to a family reunion and no one, none of us, the eight children could figure out exactly where it was from no one recognized it but they were that group of women they were so prolific in their quilt making it it's no doubt that there there would be quilts that uh, go under the radar what did they use for the batting usually they didn't have a batting I think they used um, like a flannel sheet so they'd use like a sheet they'd put the applique on the sheet and then they would have a flannel sheet in between and then a flannel backing. So really kind of more of a coverlet sort of thing, a really never sort of squishy, puffy battings, either polyester or cotton. They, they didn't really do it. It was mostly onto a foundation um, and just layered sheets. They made some interesting choices, but they made them, well, especially the, the one where we're not really sure who made it because of such a wild um, array of fabric, including double knit, um, it's quite heavy. Like it's a very heavy blanket and it has, it, it just has a wonderful weight to it when you're, when you're sleeping under it. And so I've been thinking about doing the same with some future work. I've been gathering like wool blankets that I think I might use as sort of like a, as the batting um, inside my quilts just to give it that extra weight especially for the the quilts that we have around the house because I just have such fond memories of that that heavy weight of a quilt on top of you. I made a couple of heavier quilts this year and one was because I used a batting that had a flannel on it and the other one I used two layers of linen one on the front and one on the back and mm -hmm. both people just said how much that weight just helps them sleep. You know, other yeah. people are looking for light ones, but my family's looking for, for heavy ones. So I've just done mm -hmm. my first double batting one. See how that turns out. Yeah, I love the idea of experimenting with those thicknesses. My Ukrainian grandmother, my Baba, she also made, um, she made coverlets uh, with wool inside them. So like wool batting that she would lay out. And those, those are really thick and really warm and really heavy. I've since made sort of a patchwork duvet for that one and, and tied, right? The, I think those really heavy quilts, there's no sense in trying to quilt them um, in any way other than to, to tie them. And I, I've seen a resurgence of tied quilt in the modern and art quilting circles. So I, I think that's fantastic. Um, it's, a, it's really interesting to me because that's, to me, it's getting down to, to roots. It's so much faster to tie a quilt than it is to quilt it. Like you're saying, the heavier fabrics or the multi-layered fabrics, so you don't have to worry about getting those through a machine, like denim quilts and puffy quilts. When did you start making your first quilt? I made my first quilt. It was a little lap quilt in, I think it was grade five or six. It was um, for like a home ec project and it was hand quilted. I think I, have, I, I think I still have it in my hope chest. It's small. But the first quilt that I, that I actually made was a, a gift for my parents that I made when I was in university around 22, probably years old. And I was such a jerk. <laughs> I was really excited about quilting. I had it all set up. I pieced the top and then I handed it to my mom saying, here's a quilt for you, but I'm not going to quilt it. Can you quilt it? <laughs> but she took it and she quilted it and it's, it's lovely. I didn't know the patterns at the time, but it was like a trip around the world pattern. But the reason I got back into it 
as I mentioned, a librarian by training, and I love libraries, and I love the uh, Victoria Public Library, and uh, I especially always have haunted the craft or, you know, sewing sections of those of libraries, and I came upon a copy of Jean Ray Laurie's um, Colts and Coverlets book, and it blew my mind. It blew my mind because, you know, it was, it was published in 1970. You open the book and although some of the stuff is dated some of the stuff is just wild modern amazing and i didn't realize that quilts could look that way i mean i knew my family quilts but what really struck me was in i've got it right here and there's this a picture of a this quilt here it's like a velvet quilt and it's called, she called it Hills and Valleys. And it's, um, it's filled. So it's like a really raised quilt like this where it's stuffed. And my aunt had made our family um, this quilt. It's the spitting image. So she must have, you know, in the late seventies had this book and made it. And, and there aren't really specific, not, not super big detailed instructions on how to make it, but I saw it. I saw the quilt and I was like, that's, what Aunt Maggie used. What else is there in here? And and I just started seeing like amazing quilts like this. And I didn't realize, I just, it, they, it blew my mind. There were these scrappy, intricately pieced. She goes into a lot of detail about applique, which I recognize from my family quilts. And her writing is just so clear and permissive and expansive. And I thought, I can, I can do this. These, these quilts are wild. They're so interesting. I can, I can do this. Like, and, and even looking at them now, you know, this is wow. some beautiful Perpunto work. And this book, she features the work of a lot of different artists. That's not just her work. And I just, it blew my mind. And I thought, you know, this is the, these are, this is an old book. These are old quilts by now, but the work is so fresh. And it was just so inspiring. I knew nothing about quilting guilds. I, know, I knew nothing about modern quilting was starting to, starting to kind of come up. You know, art quilting had been, was big. And so I started easing into the community, but mostly inspired by what, was, what I was seeing in Jean Ray Laurie's book from, from 1970, just because it could be done. There was this distinct quilt that I know that my aunt used as inspiration for a, a really dear beloved quilt um, in our family and so I knew it, it, it could be done I knew it was possible to do and so I started quilting but I have hardly any of those quilts from that time um, other than the one that I gave to my mom to finish quilting they were small they were just sort of lap size because I was experimenting um, and they mostly ended up cat, like uh, cat quilts <laughs> they got really gross and uh and they were kind of disposable I guess They're, I just have one quilt left over from that time which um I kept more care of and didn't let the cat throw up on. <laughs> so you hung at QuiltCon in 2019 in Nashville with your quilt shattered, but that is a very muted palette and quite different. And I know from your artist statement that you were recovering from an illness. Do you think your convalescence influenced your color choices on that? In part, yes. So what I, I was recovering from a whole series of kidney stone issues. And what I actually set out deliberately to do when I, when I started that quilt was to work with a muted palette, because that's what many modern quilters gesture towards is about sort of muted palettes and, and low volume quilts. And I thought, well, I'm going to try making a low volume quilt. I'm normally a riot of color, but let's let's try. Let's see what we do when we when we back off a bit. Um, but of course, I couldn't just leave it completely white and black. And I introduced those pops of color to sort of provide interest and well, provide interest for myself and then interest visually too. I was really pleased with that quilt. I spent a lot of time uh, quilting it. I was just very pleased to how it all came together because the concept held together, the, the piecing held together, and then the quilting also um, really worked to tell the story. It's very densely quilted. It's probably one of my most densely quilted pieces, partially because of the size. It's, it was manageable. I mean, it's only maybe a meter by a meter. It's not, it's not super huge. I did have in mind, you know, kidney stones are usually white. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> 
Um, but it was also about the pain. Um, it was mostly about the pain. And in my mind's eye, that pain is, is white. It's like white noise. It's like that white noise that distracts, that doesn't let you um, concentrate, that sometimes just completely um, bowls you over. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, again, it was one of those pieces that when you when you finish it you go yeah this 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 is this is a good one and I was pleased to see that the modern quilt guild thought so too but it's also also st strategic too you know if you look at the categories in in shows and you say okay well what in these categories could I possibly um submit and and so you know, if you know that there are certain types of quilts and you're very invested in, in getting into a show, it doesn't hurt to be strategic. So that kind of just all came together and, and was shown. I was really happy about that one. Your day job is you are the territorial archivist for Northwest Territories. In your daily work, as you're cataloging the photographs in that, are you looking for quilts and handicrafts? There is such a an amazing wealth of artistic work traditionally in the north whether indigenous artworks um, or artwork brought up and art traditions brought from um, settler groups it's an interesting question that you ask because i'm currently working on creating some cataloging assists for my staff so to be able to point out you know, if you see this sort of thing in a photograph, it, it's, it's really critical that you describe it so that when you describe a photograph, you make it more discoverable. And that's one of the biggest challenges because there's no OCR God <laughs> that um, looks at photographs and then assigns what is described in those photographs. When you do a Google search, someone is actually um, attached or tagged, you know, th that photograph with what it is so that's why those visual searches are imperfect right now where so you just get sometimes you get a weird mess of random images or kind of close but maybe not exactly what you're looking for so archivists are really uh, invested in doing that cataloging work so that um, when someone is looking for beaded moccasins they can pull them up because there's no way other than the words that we add to that de description that will help pull up that beaded moccasin. So any any artistic work, any handwork, um, especially traditional like quill work and beadwork and um, just sewing with furs and, and skin clothing, those are really important types of work that sometimes have been under-described in the past, maybe because of different priorities of different people, but I'm really trying to push the importance of women's work, especially, and making sure that we describe it properly so that people can find it. You know, sometimes it's you would think it's a little thing, but if you describe a woman doing beadwork and then you look at it and actually she's doing embroidery, that's those are two very different things. And if you're looking for embroidery, um, someone doing embroidery work or examples of embroidery, of embroidery in a photograph, it, it's really critical that you're identifying the technique really well. So that's something that I'm really invested in doing. But as for quilt making in the North, we have examples of them in, in the museum collection, but um, it hasn't been something that's really come forward to me. So I'm really excited when I get to see pictures inside buildings. So a lot of photography that we have of the North is from outsiders who come North and then they're taking photographs of the people that they met and maybe they lived here for a few years and then they went back South. And, and then often we're, we're so, we're so grateful for that photography to be donated back up because um, Northern folks taking photographs is less common until a certain time or those photographs sometimes get lost or, or that sort of thing. The difference between a visitor coming and taking photographs and someone taking their own photographs is often in taking photographs inside. Partially that's due to technique, right? If you don't have a good flash system, you're not going to be able to take good pictures inside a building and you're not going to be capturing that sort of home life, including quilts blankets, coverlets, what are you using for textiles inside the house? And it's those, you know, photographs of, of life, of domestic life that are um, 
that are really exciting. They really bring you into the time when you see how people were, were living. Um, we have some amazing photography now that, um, that is showing that home life and that intimate life, which I'm so grateful for. I just know that in my own life, look at the pictures of my grandmother or my great grandmothers, and they're all taken in their Sunday best in front of whatever. And every so often you get a picture behind the scenes in the kitchen mm -hmm. and you realize mm -hmm. my grandmother made a Christmas dinner on a tabletop. She didn't have counters. She didn't have a refrigerator or she had an ice box or whatever. And just that reality of how hard that would have been and the skill and the brain space she would have needed to do that. I can understand those behind the scenes pictures are just so important. They're so precious. I was so thrilled a few years back at work. We received a donation from a trapper, a Métis trapper, and he was a total shutterbug. He, he loved photography and he took photographs of the cabins on his inside, um, the inside of his cabins and the inside of his tents on the trap line. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. Because normally you'd have a visitor coming through. Oh, we're going to visit so and so on his trap line. You take a photo of him outside and you move on. But these photographs are so intimate. You see what he was just eating. You yeah. see the different uh, radios that he had. You see the uh, picture of uh, Loretta Lynn uh, that he had put up. You know, it's, it, it, it's that intimacy is just so, so wonderful. And I guess it's, it's one of the reasons why I used to get frustrated looking at pictures of quilts on beds. Because I wanted to see the whole thing. <laughs> I don't want to see, you know, because you miss the drop and all of that. I love to see them. Like I do love to see them as squares or rectangles. But when you see them on a bed, you see the way that they're meant to be designed, if, if they're bed quilts, right? And, and so that, that, it totally makes sense. I just wish you'd have a sort of a side by side. Here it is on a bed and here it is. <laughs> or, or you look at the old quilts that are sort of T-shaped because the, they, don't, they, they don't waste that corner bit with, with fabric. That's just the, the front drop and the side drop because then you can, then you imagine them on the bed so, so beautifully that way. And, and they look so odd, just sort of uh, as a flat lay, but uh, beautiful in both in both ways. One of the things that frustrates me about the documentation of crafts and everything, like they talk about the handwork and they talk about, you know, the, the, the layout and fabrics and whatever, but they don't seem to tackle what this was fulfilling for the maker. If you were a smart woman and liked math and you were in the middle of nowhere, what did you do to stimulate your brain? Or, you know, just other ways, like you like the way color changed and whatever, all that work in the quilling and everything, what was that doing to the brain of the, of the maker? I'm almost less interested in the result as I am in the person behind the maker. No, it's true. I, I think about my, my great grandmother and my great aunt, they had a sort of a, a seasonal round in the way that they would produce these huge amounts of quilts that, you know, the, the piecing would happen at a certain time of the year and they didn't, then they'd get together and, and quilt the thing. You know, the, the, there were stages to it and it, um, because they lived in Saskatchewan, um, a lot of it, you know, it sort of was around harvest. So, you know, you, there's certain things, certain times a year that they were too busy to do anything and other times a year where there were sort of these long stretches that they could work. You know, the ebb and flow, the seasonalness about it. I, I know that I, my work tends to change depending on, the, the the time of year for sure and definitely when you when you talk about what does this work fulfill for us I mean there it has for my great-grandmother and my great-aunt it was um, a social function it was um, a welcoming of new life into the family into the fold it was a celebration of major events no matter how many children there were in that family everyone got a quilt you know, and that's a huge, that's like, we're talking about large numbers here, but they, they made it a point and it was, you know, essentially like ceremony. Right. And, and also too, I imagine a, a social thing for the, the mother and daughter to get together and, and to be working together on these things. And, and um, they were their own characters too. Um, so, so the way that they, they work together, I imagine must've been really interesting too. Could be, I, my aunts and uncles kind of grin when they talk about those women. So uh, I can't wait to really tease those stories out. But I know for myself, 
it is definitely all about it's it's a mental stimulation um both for shape and for color um i hate i do not follow patterns i cannot stand it i'm not going to waste my time i don't want some i don't want someone else to have figured it all out for me i want to i want to venture out there and figure it out for myself because that's that's the fun part looking at a corner of it going uh, that doesn't work. I don't know why it doesn't work, but I have to take that apart. I'm going to redo it. I'm going to put this, this piece that has, you know, uh, a lighter color in it. Um, I want to balance it out. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, and it's a wonderful brain massage. Also too, I, I, I don't know about you, but when I sit in front of the machine, it's a meditation. I am there. I am present. You have to sit and concentrate on the thing that you're doing. You can't be thinking about all the problems that you have. You can't be thinking about dinner. You can't be thinking about, you know, whatever other preoccupations you might have. You have to be present. Otherwise, it's going to go sideways. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, it's a beautiful, um, mindful meditation, I find. And so getting that sort of the meditative piece of it, but then that, that artistic and mathematical and um, sort of puzzle work stimulation too is just it's it ends up being a full meal deal it ends up being so fulfilling activity because then at the end of it you also have a product so at the end of it I, I have shattered and and I can mark that place in time and say this was my that awful time that I had those pain issues and those medical issues and I've captured them in a quilt and I can let them go they can yeah. just so what is your favorite type of quilting? Is it the scrappy quilting? Have you tried other techniques? I've tried some English paper piecing. I do like that. I like to do that when I'm on, on a trip, usually, you know, sitting out on a chair while the kids play somewhere and, and just doing English paper piecing. Even um, camping is really nice. I like that. I'm trying out some foundation piecing um, because I have a couple of goals in mind for a project that I'm working on that really requires precision and I don't want to do it a thousand different ways I want to do it once <laughs> but what I love most is um, improvisational scrappy piecing that's my bread and butter it's what I love um, I love to incorporate it different ways you know I do a lot of triangles as you can see around I was gonna say tell us about the quilt behind you <laughs> sure um, this one is, uh, it's, you can see a part of it. It's called Koi Star. It has a center star. It's quilted by Kiki, Kiki Bobbin. Bobbin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she did an amazing job on this. I really want this to be shown. I've tried it a couple of places. I haven't found the right place for it to be shown, but I'm really hoping that it does. That red fabric is, is from a Chinese jacket and it has koi all over it as well as dragons oh and yes i saw little pictures of that she yes, did an all, amazing job oh an amazing job i've done a, a few series of this sort of sawtooth star idea um, but this one i think is one of my most successful ones and the koi show up in a few different portions of it you can kind of see wherever it's sort of golden there is another one and bobby just followed the lines of, of the print so beautifully really gorgeous radiating lines um, in the stars so it's it's almost I'd say 95% thrifted fabric which I love which I I hold really dear to my practice that's a really big part of what I do too is is to use thrifted and salvaged fabric but her quilting just takes it um, to the next level so you mentioned that you upcycle your fabrics are you a person who's on the hunt for fabrics or are you just a person that accepts what comes into her life? I do a bit of both. Sometimes you get a little overwhelmed by what you have. So you kind of try to lay off. I'm a lifelong thrifter and in the North, it's also a really important way of life here as well, because it costs so much to bring things in that once you have something in you, you're always trying to repurpose it, rehome it, find someone who wants to use it. It is really expensive up here. So for example, in, in Yellowknife, we have a, a salvage section uh, at our dump. We used to have sort of really broad salvaging at, at the local dump, but now it's we've kind of cornered it off, uh, much to many people's chagrin. But there's a lot of reuse, um, even at the dump. Not just people, you know, selling things or leaving them out on their front step or garage sales or, or whatever. We have two thrift stores. A lot of donations go there. But there's just a, there's a huge community of, of reuse here, for sure. Things sometimes come my way. Some 
I'm starting to be known as the the quilter that uses thrifted fabric. <laughs> so stuff shows up. It's wonderful though because oh, I've got some right here. I I uh, someone said oh yeah, and, and they they dropped off a a bag and it had like the most amazing, beautiful batiks. Like this is a house dress. Um, I got there's a lot of yardage out of that one. These um, batiks. I don't know they. You know, I, I'm I'm not really a batik person, but when the when the these sort of two tones are just amazing, you know, clothing. This is a skirt, you know, a beautiful pattern, uh, rainbows. You know, this is an old Esprit shirt. I must have coveted the shirt when I was a teenager because it's come back to me. It's wonderful, and you know, and now large prints coming back into menswear again so you, you're finding the most amazing things and they're coming to me I'm, I'm salvaging them from the dump I'm getting them at the thrift store shot cottons you know men's shirts are made of shot cottons all the time so I just have a wealth of choice we have a um a wonderful quilt quilt fabric store here called the quilted raven and um, she has an amazing selection. She's really well supported by our, our quilt guild here in town, as well as other sewists um, coming in to do other types of work. And But at the same time, there's vast resource of reuse um, that you have available to you if you're interested in. And I love them because they have stories. Often you don't know what the stories are, but you know, to pick up an African dress and say, oh, you know, does this come from, you know, a member of the, um, African expat community probably you think about the journeys that these textiles took to come all the way to your northern town or, or your town wherever you live and you can do amazing things with them like this is a just an extra block left over from a project I was working on this was this amazing it's polyester a, but a, an amazing dress full of parrots and I said oh my god I can't leave that on the rack <laughs> <laughs> the thrift store that's coming home with me I'm cutting it all up and I'm gonna make all these sawtooth parrot stars love um, it just, just love it just love them they're they're so much fun so speaking fun. of stories would you share with me the story behind the northern pike headdress oh <laughs> sure well I'm Ukrainian Suliak is a Ukrainian name um it sounds Inuk but it's not I understand that uh, Suliak is a word in Greenlandic Inuit language for uh, a type of seal, but what it really is um, for uh, for me, it's it's a Ukrainian name. And so the the uh, tradition of the vanok, or the flowered headdress, is a point of national pride, and it's uh, it's a symbol of fertility and women's power. I'm working on a on a sculptural series um, based on the vanok and how it crosses over to my northern life. But as I'm working on that, a very dear friend of mine had an important birthday this summer and she was having a party and she throws the best parties. And she asked for everyone to contribute um, a performance or something like that. And so we all pulled out uh, the stops for this friend of ours. She comes from Northwestern Ontario, Kenora, where if you know Kenora, you may know about Husky the Muskie, which is like a 50 foot muskalungi fish <laughs> so i had to make her a pike um vanok. that was a wonderful <laughs> summer project and yeah it was crazy you know uh, there's photos on my on my feed but there's like i like the glitter <laughs> five kinds of glitter i became an expert on glitter <laughs> But if you know my friend, you know, one type of glitter is not enough. If you can do five, then do five. Yeah. So, <laughs> so but, this might uh, be a silly question to ask an archivist, but do you put a label on your quilt? I do, but I only do ones that I think are going to go to show. Isn't that terrible? Um, so I, this one doesn't have I a am shocked. label yet. <laughs> I know it's terrible. When I gift them, I always put a label on them so that they um, usually it says who it's for and who it came from and the date. But I have a whole bunch of quilts at home, um, the ones that we just have in, in normal use that, uh, that still deserve some labels. Not the ones for my kids because I've labeled those, but not the general ones. And this one doesn't have one yet either. So... I really should get to it. I'm stubborn about them. I usually embroider the label so it takes longer. And that 
<laughs> I love embroidery, but it also just, it takes longer. So if, if I don't have to do it, I don't. <laughs> I haven't put any labels on my quilts ever. And I just started doing it this year. Just yeah. started doing it this year. But I, I now realize the trick to it is to make the label at the beginning. Don't do it at the end where, you know, with that last stitch of the binding, you're going, I'm done. <laughs> no, yeah, definitely. Like the, the key would be before it gets quilted so that you piece it into your back or sew it onto the back and then it gets quilted along. I've only done that a couple of times. Usually it's a last minute thing. <laughs> Have you passed your love of quilting on to uh, any of your family members? My boys are fascinated with it. You know, I've shown them how to hand sew. They make little pillows for their stuffies. Um, but we haven't yet graduated to actual quilting. That's a good point. We're currently in kind of a, a lockdown here in Yellowknife. So, you know, what do we have the time? I should probably <laughs> teach teach the kids. We'll make, we'll make a little quilt for each of their stuffies. That, that would be a nice project. They have grown up with this all over the house. They surprise me with their comments and critiques, uh, with their compliments. They know that certain ones are new and certain ones are old. So they're, they're, they're always paying attention. And I really, I appreciate that of them. I, one of them made a comment a couple of weeks ago and I thought, oh, you are paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> if people want to find you, how do they find you? My Instagram feed um, that you mentioned earlier. And my handle is sulicat underscore north. It's a play on my last name. And that way you can think about that Northern quilter. Thank you very much. Love your time. Loved meeting you. Hopefully one day in person. It was such a pleasure to meet you uh, over, over Zoom. <laughs> Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Erin. I'll have her contact information and social media links in the notes below. And definitely check out her Instagram feed. And I'll also have a link to the Northwest Territory Archives if you are interested in any of the photo exhibits of life in the far north. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Amara Ameridan. She is a talented quilt designer and free motion quilter from Malaysia. We don't often think of quilts in the equator, but Amira is going to tell us all about it. And you don't want to miss it, so make sure you subscribe. Next time you're in your sewing room, make sure you have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing people in this series. Let one inspire you. And check out last week's video on how to repair holes in your quilt. Because holes happen. Take care, and I'll see you next time.